Hi, everyone. Um, I'm excited to get things started here today. Um, this is my platform. As you guys might know, um, this TEDx is kind of special in that all of the speakers were invited to physically build a platform, not just have an intellectual platform, but to make one. So here's our exquisite corpse of platforms up here. This is mine. I call it Mountain Junior. Um, I'm going to talk about it in a little bit. But first, I want to talk about some of the ideas that led up to this project. And I want to talk about those via a project I did in Michigan last year. So um, as Sean mentioned, I actually was the Muschenheim Fellow at the University of Michigan last year. And as part of the fellowship, it's expected that you do a sort of ambitious project in addition to teaching. I'm from Chicago. I consider my emotional, intellectual base here in Chicago. Um, but I've been in Michigan for the last two years working and teaching. And as part of the 25th anniversary of the fellowship program there, they invited five fellows, here we are, um, behind the house that we bought, to, to come there instead of the usual three. And because it was a sort of special year, we thought we'd be especially ambitious as a group of five. And we bought a house in Detroit for $500 in order to do um, experimentations, I guess you would call it, on, on the house as a way to do a design project. And so we kind of started inauspiciously. Uh, we started wanting to work together. That was unique to the, to the sort of fellowship program. And we didn't really know how to work together. And somebody just threw out, well, why don't we buy a house? Um, un unbelievably, we knew some people who had been doing this in Detroit. They've been buying up houses cheaply, working on them as an artist design uh, collaborative called Design 99. So we went to talk to them. And they said, well, the auction is in five days. So you have to go like next week if you want to buy a house this year uh, in Detroit. So we had to act fast, and we just decided to do it. So you can see the, our auction numbers there. Two of us went there, the auction book. It's this crazy event where there's just page after page of gigantic amounts of property for $500 each. And nobody really bids on them. The starting bid is $500. Sure enough, we won the auction for one of the houses that we were bidding on. We bought it for $500 under the fake name Five Fellows LLC, which we just kind of made up on the spot. So uh, we bought, this is how Detroit works these days, unfortunately, but you can buy a house for $500 um, under a made up corporation. And uh, so that's where we started. That's where we started with the project. Um, this is the house. It's on Moran Street, no relation that I know. Uh, but this is the state that we found it in, like the day that we took ownership of it. Uh, the, there was a piece of plywood over the door. It's in a pretty quiet part of Detroit by Detroit standards. Um, but this is the backyard, totally overgrown. You couldn't get into the alleys, you know, no services. Um, and this is actually how we got in on that first day. This is my colleague Rosalind climbing in the window. And this is what we found when we came inside. It wasn't as empty as we'd expected. We had some uh, people, well, not people. We had some residents there, like some plants. And it seemed like people had been living there off and on for a while. Um, and we were excited. We didn't know what we just did, but we just bought a house, and we were going to do something with it. Um, so the first thing we had to do, and this was guided um, very generously by Mitch and Gina, who'd been living, Mitch and Gina of Design 99, who'd been living in the neighborhood for years, said the first thing you have to do is board it up, make sure people know that people won't mess with it. So we boarded it up with their help, and then reality set in. We just bought a house. Sure, it was only $100 each, but now what do we do with it? We just kind of made this gigantic gamble. And you can see there's snow on the ground. There was no heat, no electricity, no plumbing. And we thought, well, maybe that's what we can do as architects. We can kind of intervene on this house by just providing the basics. So uh, one person was going to redo the plumbing. Another was going to um, you know, fix the enclosure and the windows. Someone else, myself, was going to build a wood stove for it. Um, but then reality set in, and we finally actually got uh, Detroit Edison to hook up the electricity, which took about four months. And once we got electricity, everything changed. We thought, well, now we can kind of do something more ambitious than maybe just kind of remedy this house. And we were really afraid of that way of working in Detroit, since there are so many people um, that try to sort of remedy Detroit's problem through design. We were really suspicious of that, not because we don't think people in Detroit need help, but that we just didn't think that as designers we could really fix up one house and change the situation there. So instead, we really wanted to focus on the way that this house could be a medium for architectural experimentation. 
So we made our own uh, exquisite corpse. This is a plan of the house as we found it. We kind of divided it up into different territories so that we could each kind of operate in a separate part of the house, collaborate in a way on a, on a single project, but all work independently in the different parts of the house. So you can see me on that small green triangle in the middle there. Um, and what I wanted to do was actually add the house's missing stair. Like the house had a stair, but it was pretty much in disrepair, and you actually had to go through the bathroom to use it, which seemed like a weird thing to do. Um, and so for, for us as architects operating in this context, it was really exciting because we just had this medium of a house already given to us. So instead of sitting down at a blank slate and starting to make drawings, we actually just started doing things like this. Like this is how I started. I literally just cut a hole in the floor. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do yet. I didn't have any drawings. I just knew that I wanted to put a stair through the middle of this house, and so I just cut a hole in the floor. Um, and started to add in what would eventually become my intervention in the house. I really like this slide, though, because it shows my colleague Meredith using the saw in the same space that I'm constructing the, uh, constructing the piece in. And it really became this conversation between different design ambitions in the same space. And how they would inform each other over the next few months was uh, really fascinating to me. But I'll say what I was really interested in was not just building stair but in building something that could operate uh, like more than a stair. I, I like to say that I'm interested in design that's somewhere between a sweater and a room in scale. You know, I, I, I'm an architect, but I'm really interested in the scale of operation that's smaller than a building, but maybe bigger than an object. And so I really wanted to make this more than just a stair that led through the house. And what I ended up doing was really getting inspired by the kind of lack of infrastructure there. Now, I didn't want to make something that was just uh, you know, fetishizing the fact that uh, Detroit doesn't have much in the way of resources like electricity or materials, or use sort of found materials from the site. There's a lot of sort of art and design that's been done in Detroit along those lines. I was more interested in just kind of frankly realizing a design ambition um, through really minimal means, but not in, not in any way that was sort of glorifying their cheapness. So cheapness in this project, using really cheap lumber to make this uh, kind of ornate staircase was just really an expedient way to design something. And so the, the name of the project, I called it Tables and Chairs. You can see it here. It's this kind of Q-Bert board looking staircase that runs through the house. Um, the, the name Tables and Chairs is kind of a double entendre. It comes both from my ambition to make a staircase that could be more than a staircase. The dimensions of it are based on the scale of a chair and the level at which you might want a surface next to you to maybe use your laptop or eat something. Also, books, um, the maybe biggest riser you, know, you could get away with and step on something you know, on, a, on a stair and still be comfortable. But also make it something that was kind of open and enigmatic, like something that wasn't prescribed in the way you would use it. Um, the other, the other uh, use of tables and chairs is actually I'm stealing the name of an Andrew Bird song. I don't know if anybody here knows Andrew Bird, but he's a Chicago musician. And the song is great. It's about a future where society collapses, but actually everyone's really happy about it because um, there are snacks and pony rides. And it's a really great song if you haven't heard it. Um, but what I ended up doing was like really crafting this thing out of one by two pine. I was inspired by this Italian designer, Enzo Mari, who in the 70s published this book of, of like projects you can make on your own, furniture projects you can make with the cheapest lumber available, with just a hammer and nails and saw in your own apartment. And so I really capitalized on these techniques of just making something cheaply, directly, being able to improvise on the spot rather than sort of be wed to some, uh, you know, some bigger plan in advance. And it was really a great process. I learned a lot. But I became, I think, a little too interested in this kind of cheap joinery stuff, which I really love, you know. But that's not what the project was about for me. It was about this. It was about the idea that a stair could be more than a stair, that it could be a room, it could be a space you might occupy, dwell on, put stuff on, just use any way that kind of comes naturally to you. And so this was the real ambition for the project. And I think that uh, what was really kind of uh, exciting about it was thinking through these fantasies of how it could be used, how it might come to life. Here's a drawing I made of just trying to imagine people like spending their Saturday morning on the stairs, you know, like uh, uh, hanging out, reading, browsing the internet, what people do on Saturdays. 
But during the opening was the, probably the most exciting moment of the project for me because I got to see people use it. You know, people clamber up it. People get really intimidated, intimidating of like, walking on the outside edge there. Most people walked on the inside edge. Just seeing how people would naturally just sit on the ledges and hang out and talk. You know, some people were more daring and, you know, would just like bound down through the middle. And this was the most exciting part about the project for me was putting something out into the world, like really making a physical spatial thing rather than a representation of a thing and seeing how it took on a life of its own. And so that got me really excited about this scale of working, this sort of domestic scale of realizing projects. Um, and that leads me to the name of the talk, which is No Frills, which, you know, a lot of people might like equate the idea of no frills with cheapness, material cheapness, availability. But for me, it's really about expediency. It's about this scale that I just mentioned, being interested in the impact that a design can actually have in the world when you set it free, when you let it loose and you see how people use it. And so there aren't, unfortunately, uh, you know, people lined up down the street to hire experimental designers in America today. So part of this is just the kind of bootstraps mentality of making things myself, you know, like no one is going to hire me to make some experimental stair yet, hopefully somebody will, but in the meantime I can make it myself and as, as a fallout of that I, I tend toward making things that are affordable and trying to exploit what those cheap means can really offer in, in terms of design. So no frills leads me back to my living room. This is my living room in Ann Arbor, Michigan. When I was asked to do this platform I thought well I could do a platform and I could put something in a gallery, but one of my frustrations again was just this, you know, that things can have a life, but now this house is just sitting vacant in Detroit right now and you guys can all go break into it and see this stuff, but it's just a big empty sculpture in a house. And I'm more interested in this, like the way that we use our spaces and the way they take on a life of their own. So when I was asked to do this platform, I thought, well, it's going to have two sites for me. It's going to have this site, the room we're in right now during this event where it's going to be part of this exquisite corpse. And it's also going to come back home with me. I'm going to bring it to my living room and use it as a piece of domestic furniture. So I wanted to make something that could both perform in this environment and also I would just have to deal with in my own life and learn from and live with and see uh, what it is, what it does, and see how it comes to life. So I wanted to make something that was less uh, based on any specific program, the way I was thinking about the stair as a shelf, as a table. I just wanted to make a kind of enigmatic object that might demand something of me um, in my domestic routine. So I thought, why not domesticate a mountain? You know, I, I, I thought, uh, why not cross a hill with a rug and kind of bring it into my domestic environment? I've been calling it a pet mountain because I think it's something that you know, like a, you know, like a pet, like a dog. It's something that's probably better off outside, but when you bring it inside, like, interesting things happen. Um, so this was my idea, so like, make a pet mountain. Um, of course, how do you do that, you know? How do you do that with uh, a modest budget and a modest amount of time? Um, and like many architects, I went from a sketch to a computer model for some reason, and I thought, well, all right, uh, I've worked with wood before. Wood's cheap. Uh, two by fours are really cheap. And if you guys are following me here, I'm sure you're going to come to the same conclusion. Why not stack up thousands of pieces of two by four and chainsaw them down <laughs> into a mountain shape, right? It's the natural conclusion that you would come to if you had to make a, a mountain junior. So I made the computer model. You know, I sliced it up into inch and a half. Uh, slices, because everyone knows a two by four is actually one and a half by three and a half for some reason. So I sliced it up into these profiles. I did the architecture and the computer thing, and I, and I turned it into all of these little pieces of two by that would approximate the curve that then I would carve down. And then my brother and I stacked them all up and glued them all together, and that's what you see here today. Except that I'm lying a bit because when I started to do this, it was taking so incredibly long that there's no way I would ever have gotten it done. So I quickly abandoned ship with some help from my um, object design lead colleagues and some advice from my brother. And I gave up on it and I basically taped out a five by seven inch rectangle or five by seven foot rectangle on the floor and uh, 
and just started again without drawings, you know. But what the computer model did provide me with was this jig on the left there that you can see, uh, which approximates the curve of the hill. And then we just sort of stacked up keystones to the jig and kind of freestyled it from the, um, from the keystone to the outsides of the project. So we started with it on its side, stacked it up like brick layers. You know, you can see there it is, the jig on the left, the mountain on the right flipped on its side, looks like a battleship. You can see the profile of it there. Architects really love the underside of it more than the underside of it, or, the, or rather than the top of it. There's my brother Matt who's in the room who I couldn't have done this without him. Uh, screwing down the pieces, putting wood glue on, using screws as temporary clamps. There it is, all ready to be chainsawed. There's the underside. This is the top, um, still up in the jig. And then we got to do the fun part. This is starting to chainsaw it down. So it's still up in the jig, so this is looking down on it, chainsawing away, just starting to take off all those corners, rough edges, and more and more chainsawing. These are all pictures of my brother, but just to prove to you that I was there too, that's me chainsawing <laughs> the cliff along. I was always behind the camera, um, but I got the big gas chainsaw because I'm the big brother, so it's only fair. Um, here it is moving along, more chainsawing. And there it is, finished, um, ready to be moved to my living room. There it is, Mountain Junior, um, and I'm atop it. But before, uh, before, you know, look at that, see? I didn't need all that precision. It looks almost exactly the same. I think better because it's all <laughs> imperfect. So I mentioned it's a pet, right? So like any pet, you kind of have to take it out for walks. So we thought, what a better opportunity than bringing it down here to the uh, TEDx event. So we took it out for a walk. And like when you take a cute dog out for a walk, he makes friends with kids. <laughs> Introduced it to the, the Stearns Quarry uh, Park Mountain. You know, it's good for pets to be around, other pets like it. You know, the, the hills on wheels, right? There you go, there's a hill on wheels, <laughs> mountains on wheels. So by taking it out and letting it meet some friends, you know, I feel like maybe that's something I should do with my pet mountain from time to time. But in the meantime, I've determined it's going to replace my couch. I don't really know what the future is for the mountain in my living room, but I really encourage you to check back with me in about a year and I'll tell you how it's going. Uh, thank you.